I want to bring the speaker um, who is coming to share the word of God with us today. But I think, Leah, why don't you come and introduce the speaker? Because uh, for various reasons, I blessed you oh, that day when you married him. Oh, I like that. That is even much better. Thank you, Bishop. Good morning, church. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. And because of his mercies, we are found this morning. Amen. I'm born again this morning, and I love Jesus. And I want to introduce Pastor Francis Omedo to minister to us this morning. Karibu. Thank you, Wambo. It's a privilege. <laughs> it's a privilege to serve here. Banesos Fiwe. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to you for the opportunity to hear your word this morning. And we thank you for the unction of the Spirit. I pray that God, in every void and formless place, every dark crevice of our heart, Jehovah God, that your spirit shall hover around, that as we speak your word, there shall be form and creation of life in everything that your word touches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How are you this morning? How was your night? Huh? It was Ishish. Right. Uh, no matter what happened, we are glad you're in the house of the Lord. And this is the day that the Lord has made, that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like us to read the Bible from the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 9. The book of Hebrews chapter 9, I'll read through to 14. The book of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 to 14. Did you carry your Bibles to church? Right. Let's read now. It says, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let's read that again. How much more? To serve the... We are gathered here today in a very auspicious and special occasion as we think and commemorate the resurrection, the death of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's such a privilege today that we are seated under this grace to remember that something happened 2,000 years ago. But as we think and meditate and reflect on what happened, we must really think about the significance of what happened at the cross of Calvary. The Bible tells us that no longer do we sacrifice the goats, the heifers, and the lambs, but there is a better sacrifice. In fact, the theme of the book of Hebrews is to show us that there is a better thing. That's why Christ is referred to as a better sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews also tells us we have a better covenant. And he also tells us that we have a better tabernacle. So we are living in an age of better. Everything is better. I know we look uh, 
in history and think about Abraham and talk about Isaac and talk about Elijah and Elisha and the great things that God did through them and the experience they had with God's presence. But Hebrew is telling us that we live in a better time. We, we have a better sacrifice. We have a better high priest. We have a better tabernacle. We are living in the best moments. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says that the prophet longed to see this day. That the patriarchs longed to see the, uh, this day. In fact, Abraham dreamed to see this day. Meaning that they dreamed and they, they, uh, they, they had a thirst and a longing to live in the days that we are living in. Because what we are experiencing today is nothing compared uh, to what they experienced. We have a better sacrifice. We have something better. We are no longer carrying bulls and goats. But most of us, you know, are stuck in the old covenant. Uh, when we read the Old Testament, we do not differentiate that we have a better thing today. That today we are not just going to a temple which is a building. But God has called us the temple of God. That we in-house the presence of God. That no longer is he dwelling in the buildings on the temples that are created by the hands of men. But he is living in the living sanctuary that is us. So we have a better covenant and a better sacrifice. When God was about to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, he said, after many plagues, and we were taught here by Pastor David about the significance and the meaning, the symbolism of those plagues, what they uh, symbolized. But finally he said, now I want to do a great act that is going to shake the whole of Egypt because I'm going to kill their firstborns. And this time, Pharaoh is not going to hold on you. In fact, he's the one that is going to hearken you or to push you out of captivity. And I know that in this season that Jehovah God has been resurrected, the enemy is going to push you out of your captivity. He shall no longer hold you in that captivity. Because God is about to do something that is going to cause him to push you out of every bondage. He says, now I am about to do something in Egypt that is going to cause him to push you out. And he said, each and every one of you, you are going to take a lamp, one for each household. I'm talking about Exodus chapter 12 from verse 1. He says, now for every household, you are going to take a lamp, one for a household. And if a household is too small, you are going to invite your neighbors and your friends. And then you are going to sacrifice that lamp and kill that lamp and feast it with your household. And then the, the, the Pharaoh is going to push you out of Egypt. That is why he says, while you are doing that, you must make haste. You must be prepared. You must be ready. Be prepared because after you have done that, then the enemy will have no choice but to release you out of bondage. So while you do that, be prepared. And it says before you, you do that, go to your neighbors and your friends and the people around you in your neighborhood and borrow wares of gold and of silver because God is not going to leave you and get you out of captivity empty-handed. May this season bring wealth to your life. You see, this is a season God says that I'm not going to release you empty-handed. So go! Borrow from your neighbors. Take as much as you can. Because God is about to release you. I want to declare to you right now. In this season of Easter. That God shall not deliver you empty handed. God shall deliver you with everything that the enemy has stolen from you. He says the years that the enemy has stolen. The canker worms, the palmer worms. And the caterpillars have stolen from your life. God is getting them back for you. So borrow as much as possible because I'm just about to do something that shall shake the nation of Egypt. And God told them, now get a lamp in your household and sacrifice. 
I want to share with you a few things that the blood of Jesus has guaranteed to us as believers. Remember, it is not for the few that he has chosen. It is for everyone that chooses. It is not for the titled men. It is not for the bishops, the archbishops, the reverends and the pastor. As long as you believe, <laughs> this heritage is for you. As long as you have faith, this heritage is for you. As long as you appropriate the blood for your life and for your situation, this heritage is for you. Are you ready? Are you ready to hear what God has appropriated for you? Number one, God has given you protection by his blood. When he said it is finished on the cross, one of the things that he meant was protection for you. That now you do not live in fear, you do not live being afraid or not wondering what men and women are going to do for you. I've listened to the many prayers of the saints and many of the prayers that we make are founded or predicated upon fear. Because we are just fighting things. We have not come to the revelation that God has already protected us. He says, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13, what does it say? Exodus 12, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. Read this with revelation. What does it say? It says, now... He says, the blood shall be a sign. And that blood shall be applied on the doorpost of your heart. And that blood shall be a sign that when the angel of death passes by, he shall not touch your house. Because that sign shall see there is covenant in that house. There is covenant in that house. That there is a son of covenant in that house. And this scripture tells me now I do not need to pray for certain things. Because I receive protection not by prayer. I receive protection by heritage. There are things that I do not necessarily need to pray for. But I need to appropriate by my position in God. That when I am properly placed, then I am protected by his blood. <laughs> you see, there are things that you receive because of, uh, of relationship. <laughs> How many people here, your children tell you every day, please, when you go to sleep, we go to sleep, protect us. Lock the door for us. Ensure that our house is secure. How many? How many? Because they know it is their right <laughs> by heritage. They don't pray about it. They know it is by heritage. They know it is by their relationship. Do you know that once they leave their house, when they go to their own house, now they start locking the doors? Why? Because they know they have moved out of that heritage. They have moved out of that position, out of that relationship, isn't it? Ah, they have moved out of relationship. <laughs> so, I do not pray protection God. The devil don't hurt me. No, I am protected by my virtue of relationship. By the mere application of the blood of Jesus Christ on the doorpost of my heart, I have a sign, a sign of covenant. Let me, child of God, you do not need a man of God to lay your hands for you to be protected. Be empowered as a Christian. Do not live in the old covenant that you need to run to the, the, the church office all the time for protection. You are protected. God has commanded protection upon you. He says, whoever touches you, touches me. You are the apple of my eye. How much do you take care of the apple of your eye? <laughs> Say, touch my feet anywhere else, but not the apple of my eye. Because you are protected of him. 
That is why the devil said, he looks at God and said, uh, God said, go and touch Job. I've given you permission. But the devil says, but that is not possible. Seeing that you have surrounded and guarded him, God must give him permission to attack you. Because you are protected by covenant. He says as the, the, the hills protect around the, the hills of Zion, Mount Zion. So the Lord encompasses around his people. The Lord is a wall and a wage of fire around his people. So don't live a scared life. <laughs> You are protected of God. Elisha told his servant, those who are for us are more than those who are for them. Do not look at the multitudes through the, your own natural eyes. We have a greater army around us. You are protected of God. So protection is one of the guarantees of the blood of the lamp. He says we no longer sacrifice goats and heifers and lambs, but Christ has come. In fact, Hebrews says he carried his own blood and entered as the high priest to the place of sacrifice. So number one, tell your neighbor you are protected. Say you are protected. I have been surprised at the, the length we go to to seek for protection. Do you know there are believers who drive for miles to seek for a man of God? They don't know. Help that they are looking for is in the house. <laughs> it is already in the... You don't need to, 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 to destroy pots, isn't it? That is not the purpose. Nobody forms pots to break them. Huh? Say, break this. I can see my curses broken. Please. Are you in Old Testament or New Testament? Because <laughs> we selectively pick those scriptures while refusing others. If you are, you are in the business of breaking pots, bring lambs also. We shall receive them. Bring cows every Sunday. We want goats to be coming. Let's take it wholesale. If you want to obey the law, let's obey the law. Eh? But the law brings bondage. Grace brings freedom. Wherever the spirit of God is, there is liberty. Walk in the freedom of God. Another thing that God gives you is called authority. Authority. John chapter 1 verse 12, he says to those who received him, isn't it? Not to the reverence of the bishops, no. Give us that scripture so that we read it together. What does it say? But as Come on, have you received him? Ah, ask your neighbor, have you received him? Now let's read it. Say, but as many as have received him, to them he gave. To those who are using the word right there. What does, is right? Right means now you can access what we call the Bill of Rights. Whatever is guaranteed to the citizenship of that country because you have the right. And that right is authority. You have the power to exercise dominion. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he says, subdue and have dominion. When you listen to most of the Christians, it's not dominion they are living with. Uh, they are under subjection. Because do you talk as a man of authority? Do you talk as a woman of authority? As many as received him, to them he gave the right. KJV say the power to become the sons of God. And we are sons by right. Romans 8, 13, 11 to 13. He says, now we have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. We have the right to be called sons. We have authority. Let's read Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Verse 11. 
Revelation 12. 12 verse 11. Read it with me. It says, and, and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives too. They overcame. You know, overcoming there is not a religious term. It's a legal term, isn't it? Overcoming is military, isn't it? You take on authorities because you take on governments. You take on governments. Remember, God did not give us religion. He did not bring us a system. That's why there was no priest, no services, nothing before the, 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 the law. At the Garden of Eden, there was no command. <laughs> the fact that the devil is there does not mean he should harass you. Do you know the devil was there in the Garden of Eden? Huh? The devil did not come because they fell. Hmm? The devil was already there. He says he was walking in the coolness of the day, isn't it? And communing with God. And the serpent was there. Huh? Serpent's presence does not mean dominion to you, isn't it? But most of us, when we see serpent, we are scared. We are being finished, isn't it? No, you have authority and power over all those powers and principalities. It says, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, that it be known to principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God by the church. That God has chosen you as the church to show forth principalities and powers how powerful he is. And is using you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, tell your neighbor, God wants to show the world. How powerful he is through you. So don't cry. Eh? Don't cry. Exercise authority. God says, if you have see, uh, uh, faith as little as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Mark chapter 10 verse 23, you shall speak to this mountain. But most of us are not speaking to the mountain. We are speaking to God. God, please remove this mountain. He says, you speak to the mountain. You have the authority. If you have faith as little as a mustard seed, speak to this mountain. Say, sickness and disease, you are not my portion. Get out of here. Be removed and be cast into the sea. And if you doubt not but believe what you have said shall come to pass, you shall have whatever you say. Huh? Because the authority is inside of you. How many people here have been arrested by a policeman and the police says, uh, the president says, hmm? the president is saying if you overspeed, you park. Come on, come and park. Does he say that? Uh -uh. It is assumed authority, isn't it? It is assumed authority because he's already representing him. That's why Elijah said, it shall not rain but my, my word. It was of his authority because the authority is invested in him. The authority is invested in him. Give us Matthew chapter 10 verse 1. When Jesus was sending his disciples, what did he say? 10 verse 1. Come on, read this together with me. He says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power of unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of... He gave them... When he had called who? The overseers? The reverends? The pastors? He had called who? Are you a disciple? Then why are you having problem with demons? He gave them power. He said, cast them out. And when they came back, he said, we can't believe it. Hey, they listened to us. <laughs> he says, come on, you, you are toddlers. That is nothing. Rather rejoice that your name is, there is a higher purpose. And today you find that casting over demons is a big testimony. The church must stop so that we, we testify. Please, there is a higher purpose. There are even ministries that are established on casting demons. 
That is their vision. Please. <laughs> that is their vision. That cannot be your vision. That is the outgrowth of your, the manifestation of God upon your life. Says he gave them power to cast out demons. That they shall lay their hands on the sick. They, the disciples. Are you understanding friends? Because if you don't have this revelation, you'll always be looking for the next big, big preacher in town. Eh? The, the church office will always be your board. Eh? I want pastor to walk with me. Eh? There is no in scripture where we have been told to be walking with people. Like a whole year we are walking with someone because he's demon possessed. <laughs> Please. Eh? There are better things to do, isn't it? Come on, get hold of yourself and grow up. And appropriate the word of God. You have this Bible in your house. Read it. And take hold of it. And say, I can walk. If God, you listen to Elijah, you can listen to me. If you listen to Pastor David Kibera, you can listen to me. Arise in the power of God. And command darkness to bow before you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not the diapers Christians we are raising. We are raising mighty men of war. Huh? Because it is you that can help somebody else. So arise in this thy power. God has given you this power that you walk he in it. And once you are established. Uh, you see, God is just looking for us that are stupid enough to believe that what he has said shall come to pass. You know, our trouble is the intellectualism. We know too much. Eh? Some of us, do you know, somebody who has never studied medicine does not know the multiplication, the structure of, uh, you know, the strains of different viruses. By the time he's praying, he doesn't know that. He just says, be healed in Jesus' name. I've seen men who have not gone to school just command demons, isn't it? But the problem is with you is that you know the genesis of the amoeba, whatever, <laughs> and you know how difficult and complicated the strain is, and the chemical configuration, and you're wondering, hey, this one is tough. <laughs> and you think that God needs different strengths to heal different sicknesses. When you say, pray for us for a headache, you just say, I command you to be healed in Jesus' name. Now you say, I have cancer. Brethren, let's hold hands. Now this is, this is serious. Huh? Let the church pray. <laughs> when, when a high school guy tells you I need 2,000 fee balance, you say, receive it in Jesus' name. I believe God is going to bring you. You say, now if I need 5 million to build a house. Brethren, let, let, let's create a circle of prayer. Please, God does not require more strength to prov provide 10 million than 1,000. The strength is the same, and he has already provided for it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, uh, verse 3, he says, according to his divine powers given us, all things pertaining to life and godliness. He says, wherefore he has given to us, verse 4, exceedingly great and awesome promises that we be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He has already provided. Whether you need 10 million, when I need 10,000 10, 10, or 1,000. The problem is not God. The problem is just go, grow in your faith so that you receive it. Hallelujah. The authority is given already. The authority has been provided. Wow. Hallelujah. When the authority, and it doesn't matter, let me tell you, whether you are saved yesterday or 20 years ago, the fact that you've been saved 40 years does not mean you have 40 years experience in salvation. You might be having one year experience repeated 40 times. <laughs> and sometimes it is the new believers who appropriate the word. Because they don't have so much. They don't know so much. They just know. If the Bible says, I have power, ah, then I have power. They believe God at his word. 
But most of us, because we have stayed it in a long time, and we've seen some things that are not working, we adjust our expectations. Do you know if you went to uh, a Sunday school class and asked them, if money wasn't a problem, what would you buy? My Billy or mine will say, I want an aeroplane. I want to carry Trump of the United States, isn't it? That's their dream because they have no limitation at all. If you ask in this congregation, because after growing up, you've met challenges, you've been adjusting your, your expectations, you know what cannot happen. Ask anybody here, if money wasn't a problem, what would you do? He say, I'll build a house of three million. <laughs> because now you are making God in your own image and likeness. You want to fashion him according to your standards because you're saying men be realistic let's be realistic right let's be realistic something else that the blood guarantees is healing tell your neighbor healing we receive healing by the blood we receive healing by the blood Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgression, was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are, are, not that word, are is present, isn't it? Are is, because that is in the old covenant. In fact, let's take it from verse 3. From verse 3. Let's go back to verse 3. Verse 3. Come on, let's read this with the revelation. What does it say? He says, he is despised and rejected by men. That is your savior. Are you understanding? Says he is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Come on, go back and read that again. Don't just go through it. Read with understanding. That is our savior. What he went through. Look at that. Let's read again. He said, he is despised. Look, says he was, why was he despised? So that you cannot be despised. He was rejected by men so that you don't feel rejected. So as a child of God, you cannot sit here and feel rejected because it is not possible. Your rejection has been taken away already. Come on, give us those scriptures, please. A man of so anytime a sorrowful thought or experience enters your heart, tell it, no, you do not belong here. Because it has already been taken away. It says, acquainted with grief. And we hid at as... You see, now you cannot hide. Eh? Because what caused you to be hidden, if it is shame, your shame has been taken away. Our faces from him, he was despised and we did not esteem him. He was despised so that you do not get despised. Now we did not esteem him so that now you cannot have a self-esteem class. <laughs> now, now a motivational speaker in town to teach you self-esteem. No, the... <laughs> Or self, what is the other self class you attended? The self? Self? Uh, yeah, awareness, because you're understanding yourself. Self-awareness, to know who am I. And the guy who is teaching you is not redeemed by the blood. He's telling you according to the definition of this system of who you are. He says, believe in yourself. And he says, cast is a man that believes in the arm of flesh. He says, trust your heart. The Bible says, the heart is wicked. 
desperately, isn't it? Yeah? He says, be alive and awake. Know that you are awake. The Bible says, die to self. He says, be aware, self-awareness. The Bible says, you need to be a corpse. I am dead. I no longer live. Uh, how do you teach a corpse self-awareness? Verse 4. Please give us the scriptures. Let them stay on. Number 4. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our... Are you, are you understanding that? Says he has... Born our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we streamed, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So how do you feel smitten and stricken of God? How do you feel like you don't belong to God? You are not worthy. You do not belong. You can't feel that way. Because he was already stricken of God for you. He was rejected by God so that you'd be accepted. In fact, he says, Loi, lo, Eloi, Rama Sabbath Khan. It means, God, why have you forsaken me? He forsook his own son so that you be the acceptable of God. The Bible declares, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, that he was delivered to death for our faults and risen up to resurrection for our righteousness. See, anything that we need to go through has already been taken by him. These guys, please, stay on the scriptures. Huh? Simuna niona tayari? Yeah, so. <laughs> Number five. What does it say? Number five, he says, but, say to your neighbor, but, yeah, though you are despised and stricken and hid from God, he says, but he was wounded for our, he was for our, what? The chastisement for my peace. And by we are, we are healed was wounded for my transgression. So I cannot now, Romans chapter 8, walk under condemnation. Now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He says, for the law of Jesus Christ has killed the law of flesh and sin inside of me. Verse 3 says, for that which the law could not do, in that it was weak in the flesh, Christ was manifested and sent by God himself so that he can kill death and sin. And so that chapter verse 4, that I might be justified before the law. I am no longer guilty. I am no longer condemned. That is the message of Resurrection Sunday. That now I stand up as a son of God free and full of liberty, knowing that Christ has paid it all. That is the message of redemption. A few scriptures, uh, then we, we close. The redemption that he has brought to us, if you read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, through the blood there is redemption, the forgiveness of sins, through the blood. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. 1, verse 7. It says, in him we have through his blood, the forgiveness according to the riches. There is forgiveness in him. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Now let's read that. He says, he has delivered us from the power darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his Let's continue verse 14. He says, in whom we have, through his blood, the forgiveness, we have redemption. Give us 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
What does it say? It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be that we might are you understanding that? That in him I am the righteousness of God. Mm. Give us Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. That Christ has redeemed us. He says Christ has redeemed us from having become a curse for us. For it is written, cast is everyone who hangs on our now what happens, verse 14, that, that the blessings of Abraham might come to us, the Gentiles, in that we might receive the promise of the through. Wow. Now, I don't attend the generational curse breaking. <laughs> because however much there were so many, there must be a time when they end, isn't it? If you started like two years ago to break generational curses, <laughs> the house of my father by fire, the house of my mother by fire. You understand? Eh? And then you come for the next prayer meeting on Friday, the house of my mother. What did you forget last time? Walk in liberty. And the good news is that now there is no female, there is no male. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile. There is no young, there is no old. Everything the blood guarantees is for all of us. Let me speak to young people here. It doesn't matter how old you are. The blood guarantees you at 12 year old, 13 year old, 8 year old. This thing is for you. It is not for the old. It is also for you. So you don't come to the service absent-minded thinking this is for the old guys. No, this is for you. You can take it. You can run with it. You can appropriate the blood of Jesus upon your life and your life will never be the same again. Would you rise on our feet? Hallelujah. There is help in this place. There is redemption. Do not walk out of this Easter season with your bondage, with your condemnation. Being despised, stricken, afflicted. People are saying what about you, defining you. And you are seeking for identity and self-image. God has provided a way out by his blood. Thank you for watching. Today's message I think has been a blessing to you. And I pray that you will pass it on to somebody else. Hope to see you next time in Jesus' name.